Um, is that okay? I can, we can always, we can always continue, um, um, you know, discussion a bit later. All right, thank you, Charles, I saw that, that's great. Okay, so now we move on um, to talking about does biodiversity matter? And I know that most of you will think that this was probably, oh, um, Melanie, can we record please? Yes, we are. Okay, great, thank you. So a lot of you will think that that's maybe a little bit tongue in cheek, you know, why is she asking and does biodiversity matter? Well, I do it because you might not realize just how complicated it is to answer that question. And hopefully what I'll be able to do is give you a little bit of insight in that. But I'd like to start by asking you to have a critical look at the graph in front of you. And what you're actually looking at is the gray part, not the white part. And what I want to point out to you is that we're looking at only a snippet of geologic time. Um, and we're looking at it in millions of years. And we're in fact looking at not species diversity, but we're looking at marine families. Of course, we can still call it species diversity, but it's just looking at the families that exist in the sea. And there is a very clear trend here. And the trend is that over geologic time, there is an increase in species. So what this means is that we, if we went back to the Cambrian, there were far less organisms on this planet. Um, to the present day, there are far more species on this planet. So what you might say to yourself is, well, why do I need to worry about biodiversity? All is well, because there's been an increase. And maybe some of you um, recognize that in fact, every time there is a mass extinction event, there then follows a time of readjustment. And in fact, almost like an explosion of species. And the reason for that is that when species go extinct, there is almost like a niche, a vacancy, and species will then utilize that and diversify. And once you get to a critical point in species numbers, then competition starts. And once you have competition, then you get diversification of species into different niches from um, their original um, uh, fundamental niche. And it is because of that, because of species adapting over time and, and trying to make the best of a situation, if you like, being able to utilize resources, that's why you get diversification. So let's take an example. If we have a lizard that um, um, lives on a sandy gravel plain, and this, this lizard over, say, let's say 3,000 years um, grows in population size quite, quite heavily to the point where now there seems to be competition, intraspecific competition, so competition within the species, um, which could in fact reduce the population. But if some of those individuals are able to maybe move away a little bit, maybe go slightly up the sand dune so that they're no longer competing for the exact same living space, then that might give them an advantage. And over time, what that could mean is that this causes a separation in the species. And if that is the case, then give it a, maybe another few 10,000 years, you might in fact have two separate species that were driven apart because of competition. And so this is why species diversify and over time you get an increase in species. What is happening now is that we are losing biodiversity, we're losing species diversity at a much higher rate than in the past and species are no longer able to recover because the damaged ecosystems are no longer just left to their own devices. Think about um, the Jurassic or, or um, the extinction of the dinosaurs. Well, what happened next? 
Well, there was a huge mass extinction, but basically um, Earth was able to recover over time. Species recovered over time. Right now, with land use change, with um, habitat destruction, habitat fragmentation, um, there is no recovery of all of these ecosystems. And that in turn then is causing species to not be able to adapt to the situation. And what we may see is a much more drastic decline in species numbers. So I wanted to bring that to your attention because you may have thought, well, if we have species diversification over the ages, then why do we worry about species biodiversity? Because right now we're at a precipice, we're at a moment in time that has never happened before, where the earth is not recovering because of anthropogenic activity. So let's now take a step slightly back, having thrown that out at you, uh, to think about well, what exactly is biodiversity? Because a lot of time we think that biodiversity simply means species when in fact it doesn't. When we talk about biodiversity, we break it up into three parts. The first part is the genetic variability within a species. What do we mean by that? Well, we all know that each one of us has a different set of genes. It's the same for any population. So having a different set of genes or different forms of genes in terms of alleles means that um, populations can either have huge diversity or very little diversity, and that has a huge impact on their ability to adapt to changes, to adapt um, uh, to uh, more competition and so on. So genetic um, variability is a huge part of biodiversity. Of course, there is then species biodiversity or simply how many different species there are. Um, the last one is the diversity of ecosystems. So when we think about an organism, an organism doesn't live on its own. An organism usually lives in an environment within its own community, which um, we call, in fact, um, a population. So if we're talking about, for example, the zebras, all the zebras together in one particular place is a population. But if you put a group of um, um, zebras and a group of lions and a group of giraffes together, then now we're building a community because all the different populations together are a community. But what connects them all are the interactions. And these interactions are really important um, to the survival of, of ecosystems. And it's very interesting that if you have low species diversity or low um, diversity of ecosystems, you can imagine that maybe there will be less species as well. That then means that there are less of these um, interactions. And with less interactions, you then have um, a slightly more impoverished ecosystem. Um, that's a little bit simplified, but um, just to explain um, a natural environment, has many different kinds of interactions ongoing all of the time, whether it's a desert ecosystem or whether it's a tropical rainforest or whether it's a marine environment or another aquatic environment. All of these different environments have certain um, ecosystems and within those species diversity and all of these interact together. And ecology, in fact, is all about the interactions. So the study of ecology. Um, so when we think about biodiversity from now on, I need you to think of it in terms of these three elements. It isn't just the one. To make things a little bit easier for us when we talk about biodiversity um, and conservation, and I don't know if you noticed, but almost all of the talks that we had over this last season were about conservation. I haven't quite realized how much we had focused on conservation over this last year. Um, and it's very timely, as you'll see a little bit later on in this, call, in this um, talk. But what we do, and, and I have to say that I've borrowed some of these slides from um, um, a course. In fact, this was one of the lectures that I did um, 
uh, developed for my students. But the reason that I put these here is just as, again as a reminder that now we've recognized that there are three parts to biodiversity, but even then it is even more complicated than that. So you might start by talking about genes, but it isn't simply the genes that are important, it's also the structure and the processes that the structures can then help with. And because I'm now becoming so complex, I just thought I would just illustrate with this one example. So having just talked about um, uh, the genetic biodiversity, um, when we talk about composition, well, we're really looking at within a particular population, what kind of uh, different forms of a gene do we have? The different forms of a gene will give um, a population the resilience that it needs to be able to maybe deal with disease, um, deal with environmental changes, maybe adapt even. Um, and also sometimes some rare alleles can also be of benefit to help um, the survival of a particular um, uh, population. Then of course, when we're looking at the structure, well, we could be looking at whether an individual um, inherits from the parents the, the same um, alleles or whether it inherits a different allele from each parent. And what that would do is it would give it a slightly more diverse um, composition of, of um, uh, genes. And so when we're talking about genetics, it's not just about um, the presence or absence of certain alleles, but it's uh, does an individual have more than one um, tool, if you like, to help them deal with, with um, different challenges. And then of course, each one of these genes has a function. And so now you can see that when we're talking about biodiversity, we're actually trying to break down each one of the levels because understanding biodiversity at each one of these levels is definitely going to help us better understand where any intervention has to happen in terms of conservation. Um, so if you're dealing with a group of oryx um, in a small reserve, um, you can understand that one of the concerns would be, well, you know, what is the structure of this population? Is there heterozygosity or are we going to start seeing maybe a particular um, allele show up over and over again? And is that allele associated with a genetic um, um, disease? So you know, the questions that you would ask of um, a population could be in many different levels. One of them could be the genetic side of things. Um, and in order to then make the right conservation intervention, you would have to understand the structure and composition of um, that population so that you could then understand the functions that are either present or missing from a population. And just to highlight um, you know, how the genetic information can then have such a huge impact on the rest of the population, um, I've got a little example here. And so what we're looking at initially when you first look, you could think, well, ooh, these are two completely different fish until you look a little bit more closely and then you recognize actually this is the same species and this particular guppy occurs in Trinidad. And in fact, um, there are great color differences um, and size differences. And I'm sure in your minds, you've already tried to figure out why. And you know, it's, um, it's interesting because what we call that is plasticity, like plastic, you know, it's, it's malleable. Um, and it's, it's life history characters. So life history is essentially when an organism either invests energy in growing larger because it gives it some advantage or in maybe growing smaller because it gives it um, some, some other advantages. And so a question I, I want to ask you um, at this point is which one of these guppies do you think is um, around when you have high predation? Um, is it gonna be the red one? Is it gonna be the silver one? What do you think? You can write in the chat. I think it's the silver one. 
Yeah, I would agree with you. So that's exactly what happens. So the plasticity obviously means that these organisms gain a benefit from being colorful and large. This is a male, so more than likely to attract the female. But when there are many predators around, of course, it makes this uh, version of the fish far more visible. And so where there is a lot of predation, um, the plasticity or the ability to change over time uh, in that population, so having the right um, genetic structure has then facilitated um, the species not to become extinct, but to adapt to the changes. And so, of course, that is why it is so important for um, genetic biodiversity to be really high in order to help populations survive under certain kinds of stresses. Um, and of course, in this particular case, I'm talking about predation, but it could be competition, it could be uh, changes uh, in the environment, um, change in water chemistry, um, uh, even in, in food sources, because as I said a little bit earlier, everything is interconnected. So it is the interactions that are so important um, in understanding an ecosystem. Equally, um, it is to better understand all the different groups of organisms that are out there. And so often you will see that conservation will focus on species that are charismatic, that have googly eyes, uh, fur that look straight at you, yeah, the mammals, but have a look on this slide. Now, this is a picture I took at the Natural History Museum in London a few years ago. So it's not completely accurate anymore. Um, about three or four years ago, um, we knew that there were just about um, 1,899,370 species that had been named, okay? So we're not saying that that's how many species there are. We're saying that those are the numbers of the organisms that we have catalogued and named. We know that the actual number is probably five or 10 times as high because we simply haven't been able to catalog all of life yet. And we often focus on those organisms that we are able to see um, better or understand better. Um, and yet, you know, we still have so much more work to do. And um, just look at the insects. I mean, the insects are obviously the group that has the most individuals but I can tell you that is that is probably still a fraction of all of the insects that occur. Um, let me give you an example. If you think of a beetle, all of you will probably think of a beetle that's maybe, I don't know, one, two centimeters in size. Well, the average size of a beetle is, I think, four millimeters, average four millimeters. That's very small. That means that there is an awful lot of um, beetle diversity that is tiny so small that we can maybe not even see it with the naked eye, but all equally important because they all have a function to play in their ecosystems. And so again, it's, it's difficult um, for conservation when you don't know everything that you have in a particular environment. And it is also probably um, apparent to you now that just knowing the species alone isn't going to give us enough information because as we learned a little while ago, um, it is the interactions that are important. It is the ecosystem diversity that's equally as important um, as the species diversity and the genetic biodiversity. And yet around the world, most of the conservation legislation focuses in fact on species, even um, the red list process of, of, of uh, looking at a particular species and seeing whether it's um, endangered or threatened or, or whether it is uh, common. Um, sometimes, of course, it makes sense. You know, we do have some organisms that absolutely have to be protected. And we know that in protecting them, we can also protect other species. But if the focus is only on protecting species and not the ecosystem that it needs to, to survive in, then, then really we're failing 
um, our conservation intervention. Um, so why, why is it not a good idea to only focus on species diversity or species richness as it's also known? So, so species diversity means simply the different species you see in an environment. And another way of saying that is species richness. So, so what is the problem? So if you think about that for a minute, if we went into, mm, say, a wadi, and we start making a list of all of the plants, that's great. That's going to give us a list of names. And we do that often. But is it going to tell us anything about the abundance of the different species? Not really. Is it going to tell us anything about the interactions that are going on? No, also not. Is it going to tell us about the functions um, that each of the different species have within an ecosystem? Also not. And if we have a list only, it will tell us nothing about whether the species is from that particular environment or whether it's an exotic species that's been carried in. Um, and it will also not tell us anything about whether the community has been um, impacted by any environmental changes or whether it's actually recovering, it tells us nothing of that. Um, and so what, um, what we really need is far more well, studies that tell us about the interactions that the organisms have. And with understanding the interactions, we can then also maybe understand the changes within that community. Um, and you know, um, without, without the um, um, abundance, uh, it doesn't tell us whether there are any dominant species in that particular environment or keystone species that are sometimes not that frequent, but have a huge impact on an environment. So it isn't only knowing a list of species that's important, it's understanding their roles, it's understanding their abundances and the impact it would have if any one of those was removed. And just to, to illustrate a little bit, um, what, um, what we can misidentify when we only have one dimension um, of information is you are looking here at a study that looks at marine, at marine ecosystems. And on the left hand side, it's just simply showing you um, where the species occur, the most common or where the species numbers are high. And as you would expect around the tropics, um, we find a lot of species. If we were now to write conservation plans and only focus on those areas, we would actually miss an awful lot of other information that is subtle, but very carefully analyzing the picture um, on the right shows you that in fact, we would then leave out some other areas where you know, the functional biodiversity is in fact much, much more important. So not only looking at how many species there are, but the interactions that are high and therefore helping the ecosystems remain healthy and diverse. And so with that, we also have different um, ecosystem layers or horizons and you know this is again something that we would show our students and it's, it doesn't necessarily make too much sense but what i want to say to you is that when we're looking at a particular ecosystem we're not only looking at a one level but we're often looking at um, different kinds of of microhabitats um, the, the composition of these different microhabitats and not only in species but also in abundance numbers and it is again all of these put together that will then give us um, um, information about ecosystems. And that kind of brings me on to thinking a little bit more about the UAE. You know, does it matter in the UAE? Um, do we have such complex ecosystems that we have to think about um, the, the impact that destroying them might have? Well, we absolutely do. And I now want to link in to work that Gary Brown has been doing for many, many years uh, in terms of classification of habitats. And he started this work when he was at EAD. And so it was focused on the Abu Dhabi Emirate. And what I'm presenting is about the Abu Dhabi Emirate, although um, 
He has since been invited by the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment to map the rest of the UAE. And I know that he has submitted um, a comprehensive update to the work that he did in the Abu Dhabi Emirate. Um, I'm not sure quite where it sits at the moment with the ministry, um, but it's something that we can follow up um, with at some point. But what Gary tried to do in, in his early time of doing this classification manual uh, was that he kind of focused on the major coastal habitats and the major inland habitats. And in order to then try and, and um, um, note down how diverse all of this was, he took each one of these habitats and gave them codes. Um, and the codes would in fact have sort of like a general description or a definition. It would then also look at the characteristic animals and plants that you would find in one of these habitats. Um, where do you find it within um, uh, the Abu Dhabi Emirate? Um, and then how, you know, when you're in that field, um, how do you, what other habitats might you find? And then also the kinds of threats that might be um, um, imminent to some of these areas, and then also some references. And that's how he started. It's much, much more sophisticated now in his final reiteration. But when he first started, um, they also looked at uh, trying to give an idea of exactly where you would find these habitats. And again, this is quite crude in terms of areas, but those of you who know the UAE well will know that each one of these um, six uh, geomorphological uh, units are just a little bit different um, in, in, in soil type, in um, groundwater, in, in um, underlying um, rock, and so on. So, so this, is, this is quite an important piece of work to help us, again, look at biodiversity and break it down a little bit more in order to understand all the different levels that, that exist. And please don't, I know there are so many words on these slides. I just wanted to present them as they are in the manual. So let me help you a little bit with that. So look at the very top bullet. It says mudflats. Remember, we talked about inland and coastal habitats. So here we've got a um, habitat. And then more specifically, um, it talks about, um, if you like, uh, um, what the characteristics are, whether there's vegetation, where you might find them, and what other habitats might be associated with them, and why they might be threatened. Let's take another example. This one is classified as 4210 sand sheets and dunes with uh, distinct uh, shrub cover. So again, you can see that every level helps us understand some of these interactions that are key because of the key species that might be present or the dominant species, which tells us a little bit about abundance. So we've moved away from just talking about species diversity to also talking about abundance. Um, then again, looking at where exactly these might occur, um, the geomorphological units that they might be in, um, and then what kind of threats there are. And I think all I need to do is to show you one image for you to then understand um, why it was so important that he would describe the dominant plant species and, and then the interaction that are ongoing. Um, all of you who have looked at Haloxylon will recognize that the way that the plant grows, um, it, it keeps together the soil. It then become, becomes almost like a hillock. The hillock, the hillock then has a lot of compacted sand underneath it. These compact, this compacted sand is helping other species be able to burrow into it and, and make this um, a habitat that they will live in. So immediately you can start to see the reliance of different species on the interactions that uh, occur. So do we have complex ecosystems within the UAE? Absolutely. So just like in the UAE, in the rest of the world, we have seen a huge biodiversity decline. And, you know, there was a key study that um, I'm going to show you in a second, but um, it isn't a novel phenomenon. Um, 
I'm only going back to 2006 on this slide, but we have been talking about critical loss of biodiversity for a very long time. Um, it isn't recent. It is just that more recently, we have had studies like this particular one that have very clearly applied very clever statistics that have shown us huge percentage decline over a long study period. Now, we call this long-term monitoring. It's so important to be able to go and do long-term monitoring in order to be able to see changes over time. And so in this particular study, what they did was that they looked at insects and these insects had been collected over the 27 years using a malaise trap. And a malaise trap, I will show you what it looks like in a few minutes, um, is essentially a tent. And insects fly into this tent um, and then go up to the highest point to try and escape and then fly through a hole into a bottle. And um, through looking at the dynamics over 27 years, this is when it became powerful that they were able to articulate that over the 27 years, um, there has been a huge decline in biodiversity. And it is this kind of study that is now helping inform conservation interventions because now we have the evidence. They are still not totally clear in this study in terms of what, what has caused it, um, but without monitoring, um, there would not be any indication of, of the loss of that, of, of species biodiversity in terms of, of insects. Do we have any studies like that in the UAE? Well, we don't have many, I can tell you. Um, some of us that are on this list have been involved in, in studying the natural environment. Um, and what I can tell you is that the current situation in the UAE is in fact that there are only some um, groups of organisms where we know quite a lot about. I think birds we know quite a lot about, plants we know quite a lot about, um, I think um, mammals and reptiles, we're, we're not doing too badly. Um, insects, we are not doing well. And in a lot of these groups, we are still not knowing enough in terms of their interactions. So we may know that um, some species exist, but we do not know how they fit into the complex food webs and food chains that then sustain these ecosystems um, uh, throughout the UAE. In fact, in some cases, we are still adding baseline data. And baseline data is when you go to a place and start recording for the first time, if you like, a list of species. And as we said um, earlier on, a list of species alone is not enough to understand the ecosystem. And so myself and Roxanne have, over the last few years, been involved in a study uh, to monitor the insects in Wadi Shalka, or in fact, it's not, it's not um, Shalka alone, it's a tributary to Wadi Shalka called Kinan. And um, Wadi Kinan is um, a small wadi. That we don't really go much in elevation. It's part of the Hajjal Mountains. Um, we have quite a lot of different shrubs that occur within that habitat. Um, we usually have throughout the year some water, um, which sustains a lot of life, um, but it is also quite a dry uh, wadi. Um, you know, that kind of is a bit of a paradox. What I mean is that it, when it rains in the rest of the UAE, for some reason, it just doesn't rain there. Um, but obviously, um, it still gets water flow coming from other areas in the Hajar Mountains. So we always have water there, but at the moment I have to say that the levels are really quite low. Um, it is an absolutely spectacular wadi. Um, just to give you an idea of, of the size that you're looking at, can you see the little car? Um, well, it's not a little car, it's a big car, but it looks very little over here. So, so these are some of the, the scenery that you would see in, in that area. And what we have been doing then, um, we have been deploying this um, lace trap, which is like that tent structure that I was saying. We set it up sometime around October 2015. 
Um, so quick calculation will tell you that actually we have been studying this now for five years. So we're beginning to generate the kind of data that is necessary to be able to see a trend like the study that I talked to you about um, a few minutes ago. We placed this trap um, in between some rather unusual plant combinations, one of them being the dwarf palm, Nanorops richiana, which you can just see in the front um, here. Um, not many people know of this palm. It is um, a regional endemic and um, very little is really known about the interactions of the organisms that are associated with it. And right next to the trap on the other side is an acacia and also a cedar tree. Um, and so what we've been interested in is to try and understand the community around that area. Um, we uh, preserved the organisms or the organisms as they drop through the, the little tube. Um, they drop into 70% ethanol to preserve them. And we essentially, since October 2015, have been going to the trap every two weeks um, to exchange the bottle. And I do have to say that there's been quite a lot of support from all sorts of people, including several people I can see here um, that are um, attending the talk today. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody for coming along with us, um, you know, Reed, Chris, Sean, and, and I know I'm forgetting people, but, you know, and, and also helping with the collection of these, um, because you can imagine going every two weeks for the last five years, particularly in the middle of the summer, um, yeah, that's been tough at times, but um, nevertheless, um, in the name of science, it's, it's cool. Um, we have now collected well over 100 samples. Um, and of course, um, you never quite know when to stop. We have decided we don't wanna go through another summer because it really is hard to do it in the summer, um, but we are gonna collect probably up until the moment it gets too hot. Um, this year, and that will give us a little bit of a buffer on either side of the five years. And um, that's just to show you the top of the bottle. So right up here is the hole in the tent where um, um, insects will fly or, or walk sometimes, sometimes it's other arthropods, into the bottle, and then they'll kind of drop down. And then in here is the 70% ethanol. It's just as well, because um, if you think about what could come in, we have had spiders, we have had dragonflies, flies, midges, um, wasps, all sorts of things. But of course, we've got carnivores as well as um, other organisms. And if the carnivores um, flew in and there wasn't a preservative in there, the, the carnivores would eat up everything else. So it's very important that we preserve them as soon as they drop into the bottle. And um, this is just um, a little um, infographic, just again to show you what the wadi looks like. The um, Malay strap from the other side, so that's the front here, that's the back of it. So you can kind of see it's open on the side with a black sheet in the middle and the insects fly into that and then are a bit confused and kind of fly up to try and get out. And this is a, a typical insect soup, although, just to give you some key summaries um, at the moment, um, if you have a look at these samples, both in September and January, you couldn't exactly say that it was very thick, right? So yeah, we see some diversity, quite a lot of different um, insect orders are represented. Um, but if I show you this one now, um, very clearly different. So here we are now looking at um, March and May. And even between March and May, there is a very big difference in the species composition and abundances of each one of the organisms. And so slowly but surely, we're starting to extract information from that that's hopefully going to inform um, you know, conservation planning in, in the future. One little story we want to tell you about is that some of you might know that for my PhD, I was working on hoverflies or um, surfidae. And um, uh, Roxanne and I um, prepared a presentation for um, a conference that we went to last year. And we basically looked at the, just try to extract one particular family of flies 
from the big sample because to try and make sense of it all at, at one time is impossible. Um, over time we will, but it takes a very long time to sift even through one of these samples. So we decided to almost use a proxy taxon um, to give us some kind of information about at least one group of species. Um, and what we were able to see was that if you compared several years, so we've got 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, so not all of the years, because this was up until um, the presentation moment, you can kind of see that some years there is more abundance and other years there's not that much abundance, but there are some commonalities. So kind of December um, is a time when we always see hoverflies. So that's represented in each one of these years. Um, but there obviously seemed to have been something that influenced um, the, the big spike in 2016. So what could it be? Well, you see, that's exactly the kind of question that we want to be able to answer if we're going to do proper conservation interventions. So we looked at one possibility and we thought, well, could it have something to do with rainfall? And so we looked at rainfall between 19, uh, 2016 and 2019. And it's, it's all that it has, it's a possibility that when there is more rainfall the following year, we see an increase in species. And so not totally sure about that, but it's possibility. And, and so certainly one of the parameters we're going to be looking at is to see whether there's any correlation with weather. Is there a threat to the ecosystem? Of course there is. Um, the threat to the wadi is tremendous. In fact, <clears throat> like in the rest of the world, habitat loss and fragmentation are the biggest issues. And in Wadi Kinan, unfortunately, even though when you walk in, um, you're, you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere, um, there is quarrying going on um, for aggregates, uh, for road making and construction. And a lot of the Hajar Mountains in, in um, Ras al Khaima and Sharjah Emirate, not in Fujira, I think it's Ras al Khaima mainly, is in fact being quarried. Uh, and so the habitat is being lost completely um, in those areas. Um, there is overgrazing that occurs throughout um, the UAE with camels, <coughs> excuse me. And, uh, and goats, certainly in Ras Al we've seen that. Tourism, um, yeah, that's a difficult one because obviously you do need tourism and you do need to have people appreciate the natural environment, otherwise they won't care for it. Um, but we do see a big impact on that wadi with sometimes huge amount of people that go up and down the wadi. Um, I haven't decided whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but um, it certainly is one of the impacts in that area. And then of course, pollution. I mean, pollution throughout the UAE um, is, is an issue, um, uh, particularly air pollution and in the areas where the quarrying is ongoing, particularly there. Um, and then of course, <coughs> water abstraction um, has caused um, a decline in biodiversity because the water levels over time have gone down, water levels have come up also because we're now using a lot of um, grey water to pump underground in some areas in the UAE because we haven't got anywhere else to put it. So, um, but that's another story, maybe for another time. Ultimately, all of these activities are contributing to a loss of biodiversity. And as you will now recognize, biodiversity loss will mean maybe fragmenting populations. These populations then may be being impacted by having less genetic diversity. Less genetic diversity, meaning that maybe they're not as resilient to more change and therefore possibly contributing to their demise even more. But then it is also the physical change of land, um, different land use and, and losing habitats, um, ecosystem diversity that is then contributing to the loss of species diversity. So altogether, maybe, maybe a little bit of maybe ending on some good news because we are finally studying one ecosystem and we are finally 
um, beginning to have an insight in terms of the populations and their population dynamics in this one area. And of course, you know, don't forget I'm talking about the terrestrial environment. Um, there are mm -hmm. colleagues that have worked on, on the marine environment, like Ada that has mm -hmm. spoken to us and, and who is here. And, you know, there are some areas where we know quite a lot, um, but there are other areas where we need so much more knowledge and uh, certainly terrestrial um, ecosystems and insect diversity is one of them. And with that, I'm going to stop and I'm gonna ask if there are any questions. I'd like to give you mm. an applause. Very nice job, Brigitte, oh. very much. Thank you very much. Um, I saw Christos. Christos, there is a question for me. Can you speak to us? Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, hey. My name is, uh, How my you? Name is uh, Chris. Hi. Happy New Year. All the best. Happy Thank New you for Year, this lovely Jessica. presentation. Really interested, really interested in those in those soups that you were mentioning. Oh. But anyway, um, I was very interested to know about uh, the habitat classification, and so oh, yeah. I have two, two, two. I, I also posted it. Uh, does that relate? Because when I saw the coding, I immediately thought of the EU habitats directive. Does that relate mm -hmm. in any way? I mean, is it a similar? concept of how to, yeah. how to produce yeah. maps like that? It is a similar concept. I mean, um, I'm not sure of the final version. I mean, I've got the older version that is just for that mm -hmm. for the Abu Dhabi Emirate. And, and Gary will not mind me sharing that with you if you'd like it. I've got it in PDF form. Um, that was my, that was my second question. Yeah, yeah, so of course. Eventually, eventually, mm -hmm. will that be shared or will I hope it only so. be in a report somewhere? Like no, I mean, look, like the, the reason the reason that I talk about it is because I do I do want more people to know about it. I mean, I even include it in in lectures with my students because I think it's so important that people understand just how complex mm -hmm. the terrestrial environment in the UAE is. And mm -hmm. the Habitat Manual has really helped us understand that. Um, Brilliant. I am sure that the ministry will eventually get around to sharing mm -hmm. that. I'm positive. Um, in the Shana. meantime, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm sure they will. Uh, <laughs> but in the meantime, the older version uh, mm -hmm. for the LW Emirate can be applied to the whole of the UAE. Okay. okay. I can hear somebody oh. snoring, I think. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much again. Lovely, lovely talk. Uh, great okay, to see you again. Welcome. Hope to see you again in, in person. So, yeah, I hope so too. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Good to see you, everybody. Okay, good um, are there any any other any questions? Thanks, Charles, and thanks, Jean. Nice talk, thank you. Thank you, welcome, Marie. Okay, well, well, folks, if there's no questions, I mean, please, we can just chat. Ada, do you not have a question? I'm putting Ada on the spot. Hello. Hi, Ada. Elias was asking, what can we do to help? Yes. Um, so I think that the, the more that we can be aware of um, the impact that we are all having, whether it's in a small way or a big way, and I know that you, you can tell Elias all about that from your own work and the work that you've done with the dolphins and so on. Um, but I do think that anybody that's involved in uh, conservation planning has to recognize that um, we have to be a little bit more um, holistic in the approach that we take. So I recommend that um, whenever we do conservation, it has to really be ecosystem focused, not species focused, um, or we need to do a bit of both. And so any one of you that is involved in conservation planning, um, mitigation measures, any of that, um, please keep that in mind because um, without the ecosystems, I don't need to tell you, you all know that, but without the ecosystems, the species can't thrive anyway. 
Um, you know, and I haven't even started on talking about uh, introduced or exotic species and the impact they're having. Um, we can do that another time. I just really wanted to focus on why biodiversity matters. I don't know whether Elias, whether I've answered your question, but um, yeah, <laughs> have I? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> all right, super. Thank you. Um, all right, thanks, Constance. Um, hey, Mariam, are you in London? Mariam, are you there? Hi, Brigitte. Hey, Mariam, there she is. Where you are have, you? You have put me on the spot. Yeah, that's okay. Are you are you here or are you in London? I'm still uh, here. You're still here, okay. All right, well, it's good to know that you're nice and safe because yeah, um, things ain't great in the UK right now. Yeah, at all. <laughs> at all. Okay. Well, please stay safe. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> well, I'm taking the vaccination, so I'm pretty much bound to stay here for a while. All right. Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. All right. That's great. Good. Um, all right. Um, I'm trying to see if there were any questions. Thanks, Felicita. Um, Thanks, Nora. Uh, hello, Mr. Bridget. Hello, who is that? Uh, my name is Ahmed al This is my first time in uh, uh, joining you guys. Oh, hi, Ahmed. Uh, How are you? Hi. Good, uh, thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, those uh, traps, uh, things like uh, dragonflies. So yeah. do you think those uh, water spots in, in those mountains, do they hold water long enough for dragonflies, the, uh, the nymphs, to... Uh, yes. to to uh, yes. sure, to to metamorph into uh, the fully grown uh, insects or yes. how, where where do they uh, lay their eggs since yeah. they take a long time to uh, to mm -hmm. molt. Thanks for that question. So um, it's very interesting because if you walk up and down a wadi, um, some of the pools are ephemeral. So some of the pools um, happen when it rains and they just evaporate. But other pools are fed constantly with water. And the reason for that is that the water table, sometimes the wadi will drop just a little bit lower than the water table. And other times it'll raise up a bit, a bit. And so it isn't always, not all of the water bodies are reliant on constantly being fed with the water. And so this is why in some wadis throughout the year you will see water. Um, but then other pools are deep enough that even if they're just fed by water, they will last for a very long time. And you're right um, that we get um, the dragonfly nymphs that kind of need quite a few weeks, months, um, maybe even longer um, to, um, to develop. And we have seen evidence of the nymphs. In fact, recently, when we went to Wadi Kinan, um, we actually saw one swimming through the water and it was quite big, um, which indicated that it was almost ready for pupation. Um, and so absolutely they do use the pools. The last time when we were there, which was just this last um, weekend, sorry, Arish, I didn't let you know, um, um, we saw egg laying. Um, so, uh, and we see patrolling by, by males, um, watching females lay eggs, um, so absolutely. The developmental stages are all there within within that body, for sure. Does that answer your question, Ahmed? Yeah, yeah, sure. Also, just one point: uh, Are there like a, a, do they feed on fish or or a mosquito larvae? Again, sorry, I, I'm, what was that question again? Yeah, but well, they live for a long time. The nymphs before yeah. they metamorph. Uh, do they feed on fish and those? Uh, on those pools or just larvae of other insects like mosquitoes, for example? This is when we need either Benish or, or Gary Fulmer to answer because I don't really know much about dragonflies, but I know that they're ferocious carnivores. Um, I think they could even be uh, feeding on um, uh, tadpoles, on little tadpoles, little fish, larvae, all sorts of things that are. And those pools are teeming with life, by the way, absolutely full of them. Um, so yeah, I think all of the above. 
But that question, I need, I really need yeah, Banish or uh, Gary to answer. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bridget. That was uh, very uh, informative. Thank you. You're welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet Perfect. you all as well. Okay. Um, do we have anybody else who would like to ask a question or speak? Yes, it's uh, Agatha here. Yeah, yeah I, I actually posted one wonderful lecture. Thank you, Brigitte. It's, it's uh, just uh, amazing. I mean, it's so important to draw people's attention to all this biodiversity and, you know, so it was it was great to hear all this. And I, I just have a question about the this Wadishauka project. So so will someone else take over this this research project or are you uh, going to just to finish because it's your last season this year yeah yes so. yeah well you know there, there is such a thing as over collecting i mean um it is so important that we now spend all of our time analyzing and you know um i have only just recently moved to this apartment here in dubai um i obviously continue to go to alain but i'm going to be spending a lot of time here in dubai and so i've brought with me these samples and um, you know, um, it takes, I would say it takes, I don't know what Roxanne thinks, but it takes several days um, to just go through one insect soup. And that is only to separate them out into groups. And then comes the process of looking at the different species you have. And you know, nobody is an expert in all of them. Um, because as you saw, we have about a million insects that have been described so far. That's a lot of insects. And most, most entomologists focus on maybe a particular family. If that's a diverse family, maybe even only a particular genus. Um, you know, so we will not be able to identify everything to species level, but with the help of experts around the world, which is how Tony Van Harten got the publications of the six volumes of arthropod fauna done. Um, you send specimens off, um, people help to identify them. And that's the next step. For us, of course, what, um, Roxanne and I, what we can do is we can sift through the material. And I've got to say, Mariam has been involved in a lot of that as well. Um, we classify at least into different groups and, and we can then start to make some conclusions, if you like, in terms of population dynamics and maybe a slightly better understanding of seasonal variation um, and maybe even looking at why there is the variation, you know, what is it, what is it dependent on? And so that process is now very important. And so rather than dedicate all of this time collecting, we want to maybe shift some of that attention to now working on the samples. Um, and that is why. Um, there will not be anybody who, who goes, but what we could do is we could in the future go back to the same spot and, and put the, te the um, tent up to maybe spot check or maybe have a comparison. Um, because we would have had five years worth of data, you know, uh, at least, you know, we've got uh, um, continual data, which monitoring is so important about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Bridget. Okay. Yeah, Ada, I saw that. Of course you can help. You have to come to my house. You can come and help me. All right. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if anybody else has any questions. Well, I mean, does anybody just want to talk about the weather or something else for a minute? Before two days ago, it was minus six in, a, in an area here nearby my home in Al Ain. It was freezing. <laughs> minus six. Yes. Oh my word! The, the center, the official center here, uh, they published the data, and actually, my uh, some of the my family friends they went there and they had uh, this device. It was actually minus six. Yes. Wow, that is very cool. Bye, Charles. 
That is freezing. I mean, yeah, uh, Chris, Chris told me that it was very, very cold um, in LA and he's had to put a heater on. Um, so yeah, it was cold here in Dubai, but it wasn't, it wasn't as cold as that, I think because we're closer to the sea. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, I don't want to keep anybody for any longer than I need to. Um, can I say um, good night to everyone? Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. And just look out for news um, and our activities in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank All you. All right. Bye. Okay, then. Thank Yellow. you.